Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so um, good afternoon. Thank you for um, waiting. Um, our speaker today is um, Blair Sullivan. She's a student of Paul Seymour at Princeton. She's visiting for a few days, I guess. Um, and she's going to tell us about uh, minimum feedback R sets. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about bounding minimum feedback arc sets by girth. And those of you who have heard me talk here before know that I've said something on this topic in the past, although not using this fancy terminology. So, just a few quick definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. When I say directed graph, uh, you know, I mean that every two vertices have at most one directed edge between them. And I'm going to forbid loops and digons. And my digraphs will be simple, no parallel edges. Okay. The girth of a directed graph is the length of its shortest directed cycle. So, if it has no directed cycles, we'll just say that it has infinite girth. Some terminology that I like a little better for this application is to say that a digraph is M-free if it has no cycles of length at most M. This is equivalent to having girth at least M plus 1. Okay, but what we're interested in here is excluding small cycles. So it makes more sense to refer to the digraphs in terms of the cycle length that we're excluding. And a feedback arc set is just a subset of your directed edges so that when you delete them from the graph, it becomes directed acyclic. I'm going to be lazy and abbreviate directed acyclic as acyclic for the remainder of the talk. So it just means no directed cycles. It doesn't mean no cycles in the underlying graph. OK, so what's my motivation? It's this impossible problem from 1978 of Cachetta and Hagfist that if you have a directed graph on n vertices with minimum out degree r, then there should be a directed cycle of length at most n over r. That is, if at every vertex you have lots of choices for where to go, there should be somewhere where you can get back to yourself quickly. And the tight example is shown here. You put n vertices on a circle and connect everyone to the next n minus 1 over k. Then you can't get any cycles of length at most k, and your out degree is approximately n over k. Okay, so this is tight for all values of n and k. What's known is that if the minimum out degree is small, uh, at most about square root of n over 2, then we can prove cachetta hagfist is true. The problem is if you let your minimum out degree be big. Namely, if you let your minimum out degree be n over 3, and you want to look for a directed triangle. This is wide open. There are some approximation results. But this is the case where lots of effort has been concentrated. And general feeling is, if we could do this, then we could close the gap. So we want to think about graphs which don't have directed cycles of length at most 3 and see what we can say about their structure, because that would be a good step toward showing cachetta hagfist So one thing we notice about triangle-free directed graphs is that if you have one and it happens to be a tournament, being triangle-free immediately forces it to be completely acyclic. Okay? And the proof of this is short. Proof by picture, in fact. Take a shortest cycle. Has length m. Has at least four vertices, because the girth is at least four. So we can label vertices 1, 2, and 3. Well, what happens to the edge between 1 and 3? If we put it in from 1 to 3, we get a shorter cycle. And if we put it in in the other direction, we get a directed triangle, which is forbidden. So any graph that has no directed cycles of length at most 3 and is a tournament is completely acyclic. This leads us to ask if we have a triangle-free digraph, which is almost a tournament, maybe only missing a few edges, is it almost acyclic? That is, is there a small set of edges we can remove to make the graph acyclic? So we should quantify what does it mean to be almost a tournament and almost acyclic. So I'm going to define a couple of Greek letters here. Beta will be the size 
of a minimum feedback arc set, the minimum number of edges you need to delete to make the graph acyclic. And gamma will be the number of non-edges to avoid confusion that's unordered pairs of vertices with no edge in either direction. Okay? And we conjecture, where we as Maria Chudnovsky, Paul Seymour, and myself, that if you have a three free die graph, beta should be at most gamma over two. That is, there should be a set of edges of size at most half the number of non-edges, whose removal makes the graph acyclic. This is not at all obvious from the previous slide. I showed you that a tournament is automatically acyclic. So why a factor of two? Why not a factor of 10 or 100? Because beta and gamma are both zero in that case. Well, our tight examples look like this. Take a directed four cycle that has two non-edges, and you need to delete one edge to make it directed acyclic, right? Replace every vertex by a copy of that four cycle. It remains tight. Now gamma's 40 and beta is 20. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that green is not showing up well. And we can continue to do this. Replacing each vertex by the same tight example continues to make the graph a tight example. And the only other graph we know for substitution at the moment are transitive tournaments. So it, you take your four cycle and you put transitive tournaments at the vertices. And these sort of double arrows indicate complete bipartite graphs directed in the same direction as the edge. Okay, So these all have the ratio of 1 half. So what were we able to show? We were able to show that we can prove betas at most gamma. That is, if you have k non-edges, then there's a set of k edges that you can delete to make the graph acyclic. So we're off by a factor of two. And our proof method actually won't give us anything better than one here. We sort of pushed it as far as it can go. And it's not going to give us 0.999. So when you can't. When at first you don't succeed, try special cases. I think that's my advisor's motto. So the special case we're going to look at first is circular interval digraphs. And you've already seen a picture of one of these on the Kachetta Hagfist slide. All they are is when you put your vertices on a circle and make sure that whenever an edge is in, everything under it, out towards the circle, is also in. That is, in neighbors and out neighbors are intervals in the circular order. Okay. So we were able to show when you have circular interval digraphs, then, in fact, beta is at most gamma over 2. So we got our extra factor of 2. We were also able to prove this conjecture when the vertex set was the union of two cliques. And that's what I talked about last time. If you have you know, two transitive tournaments that make up your vertex set, then we can show that the number of edges you need to delete is at most half the number of non-edges. But that doesn't extend as well when we start thinking about larger girth. These circular interval digraphs do. So why don't I exclude larger cycles and hope to get a smaller feedback arc set? So let's bump the girth up from 4 to m plus 1. Okay? And if I bump the girth up, then I should be able to get some function of this girth and the number of non-edges that bounds the minimum feedback arc set. And before, our tight example was a 4 cycle. And now, our tight example is an m plus 1 cycle. So we just take m plus 1 vertices, connect everybody to the next one, and we see that the number of non-edges is m plus 1 m minus 2 over 2. And we need to delete one edge to make it acyclic, right? And we can play the same tricks. This gives the same families of tight examples. Replace every vertex by a copy of another tight example, it stays tight. And you could replace them by transitive tournaments. That's not going to hurt you. OK? So maybe you believe that you know, these should be tight examples. Maybe you don't. But the best thing to do is to sort of try them on some good classes of digraphs and find out if it, the conjecture holds. So we'd like to conjecture that these are worst case. That is, beta is at most gamma over this m plus 1, m minus 2 over 2. OK? So this is you know, sort of an obvious generalization of beta is at most gamma over 2. But it turns out that it's a little harder to think about. 
So what have we been able to show? Well, if we bump the girth up just one to five, we can get betas at most gamma over three. So that's a big improvement over betas at most gamma when girth is four. We got a new factor of a third. The problem is our conjecture says we should get a factor of a fifth there. So this is not a tight result. But what we can do is when we have circular interval digraphs, we can get that beta is at most gamma over 2 and minus 2. So this is off from the conjecture by a factor of m plus 1 over 2, right? Or 2 over m plus 1. So it's not perfect, but at least we have an increasing function of m in the denominator. Okay? And what I want to talk about is, is really the proof technique for these circular interval digraphs, because it's a really nice way to get structural properties about graphs with excluded small cycles. Okay. And here I said, I said we could show when the vertex set was the union of two cliques that you got betas at most gamma over two. And the reason that doesn't extend when we try to bump the girth up is that our proof method actually gave us four cycles. We proved that if you had a cycle at all and your vertex set was the union of two cliques, then you got a four cycle. So when we start bumping the girth up, these graphs just don't exist anymore. Okay. We're going to say a circular interval graph with girth m plus 1 is maximal if you can't add any more edges. So that is, anywhere you try to add an edge in either direction, you either create a cycle of length at most m, or you stop it from being a circular interval graph. Right? You can't just sort of add edges arbitrarily to a circular interval graph and have it remain in that class because you need this property that in neighbors and out neighbors are intervals. So you can't just sort of add an edge from top to bottom skipping a whole bunch of vertices. Okay? So we'll call it maximal if any edge that you, you know, any edge that you could add will violate either its girth condition or it being a circular interval graph. And because we're trying to bound the feedback arc set by non-edges, we're allowed to assume our digraphs are maximal. It doesn't hurt us. The worst thing we're doing is making the number of non-edges smaller. Right? The intervals can all be different lengths. The intervals can all be different lengths. So the kachata hagfist example was regular. Everybody had the same out degree, but they don't have to. But in fact, regular graphs are actually the only ones we're really going to have to deal with. Okay, so I'm going to define a special kind of weighted regular graph. So take a regular circular interval graph on mt plus 1 vertices, which I've labeled 0 up to mt. Everybody has out degree t. Okay, so this doesn't have cycles of length at most m, right? Then given integers, n0 up to nmt, we're going to define the graph g sub n0 up to nmt by replacing every vertex of this regular circular interval graph by a transitive tournament of size ni. And where there were edges in the circular interval graph, we'll replace those by complete bipartite graphs. Okay? So is it clear how we're creating? It's just a blow up. We're just weighting the vertices by replacing them by transitive tournaments. And it turns out that if we have a maximal circular interval digraph, which is M-free, it is either completely acyclic or isomorphic to one of these weighted regular graphs. Okay, so this was really surprising. We didn't expect there to be this much structure just from assuming maximality. So I have here the definition of a cluster. And intuitively, a cluster is just going to be a set of vertices that form one of those transitive tournaments you saw in the previous picture. Right? They're going to be vertices that are all adjacent. Everybody outside acts the same on all of them. Okay? And you can't add any more. Okay? So we'll say we have a cluster if they form one of these transitive tournaments in our blown up graph. Then to show that maximality implies weighted regularity, all we do is, first we note that if somebody doesn't have in neighbors or out neighbors, then we must have a transitive tournament. The graph can't actually connect up. Okay, so we're going to get an acyclic graph. And that's one of our special cases. 
So we can assume that everybody is connected at least to the next vertex. So we get at least a cycle. Okay? And once we have that, then we can start trying to form clusters. So look at two adjacent vertices. Either they're in a cluster together, or if they're not in a cluster, then we show that they differ in both their in neighbors and their out neighbors. The later one has an extra out neighbor, and the earlier one has an extra in neighbor. Okay? And that's not too difficult, but it allows us to say that if we have two clusters that overlap, then in fact their union is also a cluster. So if they, if they share any vertices, then it turns out that they're all part of the same tournament. Okay? So once we have this, then maximal clusters are disjoint. Right? So we really are able to divide the vertices of our graph into these tournaments, and all we need to show is that they're the right number of them, and that everybody's connected to the next T. Right? And this follows pretty easily from the girth argument. The fact that you don't have cycles of length at most m means that nobody's connected to too many. Okay? Questions? Okay. So now, what we've done is reduced from general circular interval digraphs to regular ones with weights. So now we're only going to concern ourselves with these weighted regular graphs. And in particular, when I'm looking for feedback arc sets, I'm only going to look for them in certain places, places where they're easy to count. That is, if I have a circular interval graph, I'm going to consider the cuts between any two adjacent vertices. So basically, I'm going to sort of break apart the circle between two vertices and flatten it out and delete all the edges that go backwards. Okay, so here are the cuts in green. And note that this is well defined because we have mt plus 1 vertices, and the farthest an edge goes is length t. So we only need to look at the t vertices on the left and the t vertices on the right. And then it really is well defined to say take the edges from left to right. You're not going to get wrap around because there are too many vertices. Okay, so these are our cuts that we're going to consider. And we're also going to need to count the number of non edges, right? This is our parameter gamma. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'm going to have some summation on the next slide. So C of K will just be for the ordered pairs IJ, where those edges jump that gap. And F will just be unordered pairs of indices, where you get non-edges. Okay, and the reason I'm, I'm having to be careful here is because really, remember that these indices indicate big tournaments, right? So at any index i, there are n i vertices associated with it. Why, uh, why, don't, uh, why do you know that edges only go t steps? Because we have a weighted regular graph on m t plus 1 vertices, where the out degree everywhere is t. So that was the definition of this g sub n 0 up to n m t. Everybody had out degree t. So in terms of this terminology, what do we need to show? We need to show that there is a cut between some two vertices so that the edges crossing it, when you multiply the weights on them, that's going to give you the number of edges in that bipartite graph, is at most this funny function of m times the total number of non-edges in the graph. Right? So we're going to sum over these index pairs in f of the products of their weights. Okay? And as I said, this will suffice to show it for all circular interval digraphs because of our maximality argument. So what can we do? Well, let's start with the simplest case when we really just have a blown up cycle. When t equals 1, you just have everybody's adjacent to the next cluster. Right? And what we need to show is that the minimum of the products of consecutive consecutive weights is at most this function times the number of non-edges, which we've written in a different way here. Turns out this is the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. It's really nice and really surprising. Okay, I thought about writing it up here, but it was just too many symbols on one slide. So I'll show you afterwards if you're interested. We can do the case t equals 1. 
So induction seems like the obvious thing to do. We can do t equals 1. Let's try to reduce to it. So I really hope this is visible. So this is going to explain how we're going to take a graph on m t plus 1 vertices and reduce it to a graph on m t minus 1 plus 1 vertices. Right? We're going to reduce t by 1. We're going to do it as follows. So up here, we're going to add n0 and nmt, and we're going to make those m0. So the way this is labeled is the indices on the outside are the ni's, and the indices on the inside are the mi's, right? And you'll see that if we squish together the sets at t and t plus 1, kt and kt plus 1, then when we're done, we will have squished exactly m sets together, right? So now we have m t minus 1 plus 1 sets, okay? And what did we do to our cuts and our non-edges? Well, if we take a cut in the original graph, and then we look at the corresponding cut in the new graph. So the, this is always possible except when you had a cut within one of these squished sets, right? So we're only going to consider those that don't occur between it and it plus 1. So if you take one of these cuts and you consider the corresponding one, it's exactly the same except we might have added or lost edges between these new sort of unioned sets, right? So before the distance was t, and now the distance is t minus 1. So what happens in general is that between two of the blues, there are t minus 2 vertices, which means that in the new graph, those are at distance t minus 1, so they're adjacent, right? And before, things at distance t were adjacent. So both these, or t and t plus 1, were both adjacent to 2t before. But t was not adjacent to 2t plus 1. That was too far. So we've added some edges. In particular, the edges from it to i plus 1, t plus 1. Right? So we've added these purple edges. So we've only made our cuts bigger. Right? And making cuts bigger is no problem. If we get a good cut in the new graph, it'll be good in the old graph. But we might have screwed up. Up at the top, it actually jumps t minus 1, right? Because we had mt plus 1, so it can't jump 2 minus 2 all the way around. And they're actually t minus 1 vertices between those blue sets up at the very top. So instead of gaining edges, we actually lose some edges. We lose the edges from the set that was labeled 0 to the set that was labeled t, because they're too far apart in the new graph. But if we assumed that one of our weights was 0, this wouldn't be a problem, right? Because we just put that weight 0 up at the top, and then we don't lose any edges, because there weren't any there to begin with. Okay, So if one of our weights is 0, then we can perform this induction. We make cuts bigger. We don't make the number of non-edges smaller. Larger, sorry. <laughs> we don't increase the number of non-edges. That's what we don't want to do. We want to make gamma smaller. And in general, things go through nicely. So it leaves us with this really awful slide. When all the weights are non-zero. So when a weight is zero, we can take care of it by induction. So we just need to consider the case when they're all non-zero. What should we do? Make one of them zero, because that's what we know how to handle. The obvious way to do this is to take the minimum weight and subtract it from all the weights. Makes one zero, doesn't make any of them negative. We're still in good shape. So now what we need to do is show that if we got a good set after that, a good cut after that transformation, it gave us a good cut before. And this is where we run into a little bit of trouble. So what's on this slide is basically an expansion of what a cut in the original graph with the ni's looks like in terms of the mi's which are these things that have a zero. So the graph with the mi's we know has a good cut because it has a weight zero and we've already showed that those are always okay. So when we do the expansion we get three terms in terms of this x which is this minimum weight and we can compare them term by term. Right? The first don't have any x coefficient, the orange ones have an x and the blue ones have an x squared. 
Okay. Turns out the blue terms are easy to show it satisfies this ratio. Okay. This top one is at most 2 over m plus 1, m minus 2 times the bottom one, whenever m and t are at least 1. That one's easy. The green terms we get for free because that's a cut in the new graph and the non-edges in the new graph. So because of our previous result, those satisfy the ratio. The problem is we need to show that the orange ones also satisfy the same relationship. And that's what I've rewritten down here, that the sum of the, that if you take the sum of the weights on all the edges across your cut, instead of taking the products, we'll take the sum. If we sum those up, we need to get them to be at most some function of m times the total weight on the graph. Okay. I know it's not totally obvious, but after doing a couple of substitutions for what the ratio is and what exactly the set of non-edges looks like, this is pretty, pretty straightforward. So what can we do? Well, we can get the wrong function in front of the total weight, right? So before, we had 2t over m plus 1. And what we can show is t over 2. So you can see this is exactly where we lose our factor of m plus 1. Because what happens is I can show this for all graphs with girth at least 4. I don't use the fact that the girth is any bigger than 4 at all. And that's probably not a good idea because I need some function of m. So using this, it you know, immediately follows that beta is at most gamma over 2m minus 2 because this is where we get our worst ratio and the other two ratios are smaller, right? So it's a bit frustrating. It's really nice to say that we have maximal graphs. They have this great weighted structure. We're able to use induction almost all the way to the end and then we lose this factor of m plus 1. But I suppose it's not the end of the world. So what can we do? Well, what I'd like to see is any proof that beta is at most some function of m times gamma where it's a decreasing function of m, right? Right now, for circular interval graphs, we have this. We have this 2 over m plus 1, right? For girth 5, we have gamma over 3. But for girth 6, we have nothing better. And for girth m, we have absolutely nothing better. So some decreasing function of m. This would be a really nice direction. Or what about that two cliques argument? It was kind of pretty. We can't extend it because we get four cycles. But maybe we could consider the union of more cliques. So maybe half the number, so maybe m over 2 plus or minus 1, you know, to make it an integer. But maybe the right idea is, is to use half the number of girth as half the girth as the number of cliques you want in your decomposition. And then maybe we can show this result. So the third thing that I've been thinking about is bipartite graphs. So bipartite directed graphs have tons of non-edges because they generally have two big stable sets. But I think you should be able to ignore those. So I think, but I'm not willing to write up on my slide, that you should be able to bound the size of a minimum feedback arc set in a bipartite graph by only the non-edges that go between the sets of the bipartition. And in particular, a very weak conjecture is that the worst case is taking an even cycle and splitting it into a bipartite graph and using that as the number of non-edges that you should aim for. Okay. As I said, I pretty, I'm pretty sure that the main conjecture in this talk should be true. I'm not so sure that this bipartite conjecture is true. But if not, I'd love to see a counterexample because maybe it would lead us to something other than these cycles as our tight examples. And finally, in the case of triangle-free graphs, we have a way to relate this back to Kachetta-Hagfist. 
Hamburger, Haxel, and Kostachka use this result that betas at most gamma to prove a new approximation for the out degree for the triangle free case. So they showed that if beta is at most, sorry, if out degree is at least something like 0.354 times the number of vertices, then you get a directed triangle. So they improved the old result somewhere out in the thousandth digit. But my question is, why isn't anyone doing this for n over 4 or n over 5 when you're looking for 4 and 5 cycles? If we had a result like this, where we could bound the feedback arc set in terms of girth, could we use it to get a good approximate result for Kachetta Hagfist for n over k in general? I don't know. But I think that's about all I had to say today. Of the gamma over 2 bound? The gamma over 2 bound would give another improvement in this triangle case. It would not give us a third. It would just knock it down another, you know, couple of thousandths. I think it might break the 0.35 barrier. We might be to 3,4 three, XXX, but uh, it's still not going to get us in 3,3 three, three territory. Anything that would? Is there anything that would? Yep, give you the, the if, um, Well, nothing of this form, because gamma over 2 is tight because of these squares. So we're certainly not going to hope for a better constant here. Um, and if I knew of something else that would be guaranteed to give me a third for Kachata Hagfist, I think I'd be doing that instead. <laughs>